I would like to read from Psalms 139, beginning with the 13th verse. And we'll read down through the 18th verse of Psalms 139. It says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuation were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. That's reading down through the 18th verse of Psalms 139. I would like to base our thoughts upon a portion of verse 14. As David, the psalmist here says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I want to talk about the great care and love God has for man, mankind, each and every one of us, not some of us, but all of us. It's inconceivable, and the plan is beyond our grasp as far as understanding just how special we are to God. Now, you hear much about uh, we as sinners, and we are, Uh, and you hear much about uh, those that I need the Lord. We're desperately wicked. Yes, we are. But that doesn't change the fact that we are so special to God. It is beyond our comprehension. Now, it talks about here being formed in his mother's womb. A lot has been said today about when does one truly become a person. Uh, Some believe that It is not until birth uh, that we are legitimately a person. Some believe it's beyond birth if the mother chooses so. That the mother has the decision or the power, the right to choose whether her child lives or dies. And that's where a lot of people would like to go today. Some states are enacting laws that when you can detect a heartbeat, then that is... Uh, when life begins and then uh, some uh, of the conclusion that when we are conceived, that is when a life begins. And I'd always said that, well, it's at conception. Uh, but I want to turn over to Jeremiah 1 and 5. <coughs> and that might change our view uh, somewhat here about the subject. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, the prophet... It says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Well, that goes before conception. That goes before anything else that has already happened. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. God knew each and every one of us before that we were ever conceived. Uh, We cannot uh, comprehend that, uh, obviously, because it's too far above us. Um, But that is what Jeremiah is saying. And I believe that God knew each and every one of us before conception ever took place in our uh, mother's womb. And it says that he had a plan uh, for him and he sanctified him uh, before that he was born. That he was being a prophet unto the nations. Now, fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, is this the psalmist's assessment of what took place, of how that we are made? If it is, then the assessment is true. I said earlier we can't conceive about 
of the importance and the love that God has for each and every one of us, for all of mankind. And I believe he had a plan for everyone that's ever been born. I believe he had a plan for that individual, and I'm going to talk about that plan uh, a little further on uh, as we uh, speak this morning. But I believe he has a plan for every one of us. I believe that when he came and died on Calvary, I believe before that the world was ever created, that man was ever uh, breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul, that God had a plan for every one of us. Not just for those that are saved, but for every man and woman. I mean, everybody. Yes, it is the psalmist uh, assessment here. But he says, my soul knoweth right well. What does fearfully mean? It means to stand in awe of. And to cause astonishment is that how that we were made is that how that we were formed that God looked upon man and in awe of what he had just done himself was he astonished at what he had made how can God be astonished at anything but it says that that's how that we were made and how that we were formed and God was astonished by it he was in awe of what he had done that's inconceivable as well, but that's, I believe that's what the psalmist is trying to convey. Uh, what about wonderfully? And the Hebrew word, what does that mean? Uh, to be distinct, be separated, be distinguished, to be wonderful, to make separate and to set apart. Sinner friend, if you're here lost, I want you to understand stand something. And this uh, may sound redundant to you from what the world is saying. Uh, but you're special to God. He loves you. It, it's inconceivable how much that he loves you and cares for you. And how much that he wants you to be saved. And yes, he has a plan for you as well. I'm going to go back to the very beginning in Genesis. When God made man... And when God made everything, we can find in Genesis in the first chapter. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light and it was good. It was good. God began the process of creation. And he's talking about the light that he had created. And he says that it was, it was good. And then God uh, created the firmaments of the heaven. And, and he said the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and gathered together all the waters of the seas. And God saw that it was good. God then created the herbs, the grass, and all of the things that we see. God created everything upon this earth, all of the greenery and all of those things. And God created those things, and he said, and he looked upon it and says, that's good. And then we could find that God said, let there be light in the firmament. And he talking about the moon and, and the two great lights, and he says, and the stars also. It just seemed like that, that was just an add-on. God just created the stars just, just on the very last there and spoke them into existence. And he said, it's, it's good. It's good. God saw it. God created the beast and the whales and every living creature that moveth, that brought forth and every winged fowl after his kind. God looked at it and says, that's good. That's good. He said, let the earth bring forth every creature after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind. And everything after the creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. God said, let us make man. Let us make man. We made everything else now. Let us make man. 
He says, and I tell you what, we're going to do it. He didn't phrase it like that, no doubt. But he says, let us make man in our image. Let us make man uh, like we are. After our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all things of the earth and over every creature that, that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. A male and female created he them. I want to tell you what's wrong with abortion. I know that God says I hate the shedding of innocent blood. And we know that is wrong. That is evil. It's inconceivable that man could take a knife and start are cutting up a little child and pulling them from their mother's womb. I can't imagine us doing that and still wanting to live upon this earth. But also, every one of those children are created in the image of God. And when you create or when you destroy those children, you are destroying that image. And God had a plan for them. God had a plan for every one of them, and I believe God had a plan for them before they were ever conceived. Not getting on that subject. Let us make man in our image. Can you imagine what that means? Can you comprehend? I can't, but I can talk about it. Can you understand or or comprehend what that means? Uh, That God uh, created all these things and he created man from the dust of the earth. uh, Created something from dirt. And it says, let us make this thing of clay in our image. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. And it says, and God blessed them in the 28th verse. God blessed them. God did not bless the sun. The sun. He did not bless the moon. He did not bless the stars. He did not bless those creatures in the sea. He did not bless the beast of the field. He did not bless all the creation that he made. But when he made man, he says, and he blessed him. Why did God create the earth as he did? Why did he create it with the herbs? We can find how uh, that it says. It says, behold, I have given you every herb that beareth fruit upon the whole face of the earth. It's yours. It's yours, man. I did this for you and all the beast of the field. I created them for you. Subdue those things. Use those things. Eat those things. For they're yours. He says, you can even name those things. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, what did he say? That it was good? No. After created man... What did he say? He beheld those things and said, This is very good. Very there in the original Hebrew. It means exceedingly up to abundance to a great degree. The value that God puts upon man. I've used... Inconceivable a lot of times that it is. And I I don't have the words for it. The value he puts on you and I. We can't understand it. Can't come to to grips with it. The love that he has for you and I. He knew. He knew when he created Adam. And he breathed in his nostrils that Adam was going to sin. He knew that sin would enter this world. He knew of all of the problems that he had to look upon and all of the sin and the devastation of it. He knew that he would have to destroy most of this world save Noah and his family. 
And he knew that he was going to have to set it afire one day when it was over. So why? Why? Why would he even want to do it? His love overrode any other reason he could possibly have had. His love overcame any other reasonable thing that he could have conceived. It was brought to my attention, and, and I've gone to these verses many times and in, in preaching. It was brought to my attention this past week about Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. We're talking about two chapters in this great big book. And the promises that God made to man in these two, two chapters. And I, I didn't get them all. It's not everything uh, that he promises in chapters 1 and 2 of Ephesians that I did I write down and I wrote them down. I, I can't remember them all. I want to talk about some of them. And I wanted to go over those things in these two chapters. We can be holy and without blame before him in love. That's a promise. He has given us the spirit of adoption by Jesus Christ in himself. It's another promise. It says according to the good pleasure of his will. And that's why he does everything that he does. That's why he's made every promise that he has made to you and I. And even to the lost world if they will put their trust in the Lord. According to the good pleasure of his will. He's doing everything that he is doing. I talked about in our revival meeting the wrath of God. And we can see even in the wrath of God. God's love. Uh, how that he uh, holds back a uh, wrath. Uh, how that he reserves wrath. Uh, because it is over. A uh, love is over. Shattering all of those things. He's holding those things back because he's a holy God. And they must execute judgment. He must execute judgment upon the world. But he's holding it back. And love is greater. Greater because that is what he is. Is a God of love. In him we are accepted in the beloved. We have redemption through his blood. Abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Made known unto us the mystery of his will. That we can have a knowledge and understanding of him. That we can know him. That we can call him Abba, Father. That we can go to him in any situation. In any time of need. And he heareth us. And he answers us. And he helps us. That he reveals himself unto us. That we can have an understanding. Limited albeit I know. That we can have an understanding of him. Enough to understand. That we're serving a good and living God. That we're serving a God. That loves us. It says according to his good pleasure. And several times it talks about. In this, these two chapters. His good pleasure. The pleasure of his will. That's why he's, that's why he's doing it all. That through him uh, we can obtain an inheritance. Uh, that through him we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That through him we have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And through him we have exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. And through him we are quickened or made alive that we're dead. Uh, that we were saved by grace, uh, that salvation is a gift of God, and that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus on two good works, that we are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ, that He has given us peace, that He has given us access by one Spirit unto the Father. And that's just a partial listing of two chapters of one book. And the word of God and the promises that he uh, has made. In a reading we were talking about, or reading in the 17th and 18th verses as well. 
It says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. How often do you think that he's thought upon you and I? How many times can you imagine that he's thought upon these things? We can't imagine. You try going to any beach anywhere or anywhere where sand is and you start counting that sand and see how many by number that you come up with. No doubt you take a handful of sand and you've got millions upon millions upon millions of grains of sand in the palm of your hand. You do that, you've exhausted all the sand upon the earth and it says that God thinks upon us more than all the sand. There he is. That should give us some idea of what he thinks of us. It wasn't just some idea that, oh, well, we'll make man our little plaything or oh, let's just see what happens or curiosity. And, and it is nothing like that. It was, it was his love and, and care and concern. Oh, why would he uh, send his son? It says because he loved man so much that he sent his only begotten son. That's why he sent him. That's why I freely came. I want to visit another place. And I've mentioned this verse, Jeremiah 29 and 11. I've mentioned this verse a lot of times. I think I had a narrow view of it. I have since, while studying this, expanding my view of what it means. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. What he's saying there essentially is I have a plan for you. It's not an evil plan, but it's a good plan. Thoughts of peace for you. That you may come to an expected end. And I narrowly viewed that as well. Someone when they're saved that God has a plan. Well in Jeremiah he had a plan before he was conceived. Jeremiah was ordained a prophet before he was born. You say well. What are you saying? I'm saying that's what the word of God says and I don't have to explain it any further. And I'm not going to explain away the word of God. So what was his plan before that we were conceived? What is the expected end for each and every one of us? And I don't think this is a, a plan individually anymore. For where he's trying to get us in our life. I think this is a plan for everyone that's ever been conceived. I think this is a plan for all men that's ever been born. That they come to this expected end. What is that? What is our expected end? Uh, Let's go back uh, to our original reading. In the beginning of it, I will praise thee. How many times uh, David uses those words and words similar to that in honoring and glorifying God in praising Him in song and praising Him in prayer and praising Him in, in all things concerning our lives. That is the expected end before we were conceived a God in His manifold wisdom and understanding and foreknowledge of that when He We were conceived, brought into this world, and when we die, then we are standing around the throne of grace, 
praising him throughout all eternity and world without end. Now, some people will get out somewhere and try to find themselves. It's funny the terms we use or others use. I, I don't think I've ever found that. We had a green van one time that when the kids were at home, a green minivan. You can't imagine a, a man with such class as I drive a minivan, I did. You know I'm joking. We put about 450,000 miles on that man. And we'd brought us another vehicle. And we were driving down the road one day and we'd sold it to some people and I met myself. But it was in that green van. I felt funny. Just like I was meeting myself. Somebody would say, well, I'm going to get out and I'm going to find myself. Well, so then the next will get out and say, I'm going, to, I'm going to get out I'm going to lose myself. I don't know how all those things work. Or I'm going to reinvent myself. You know what we were made for? You know what we were solely made for? To praise God. Why do you think all of these people, all of these heathen religions and all of these uh, people that uh, have never heard about Jesus Christ, how that they seek other gods, how that they are wanting to praise something, in almost every case we can find they erected them a God of some sort to praise. Without fail, whether it's in the Amazon or whether it's in Europe, whether it's in the Middle East, oh, it doesn't matter where Asia, it doesn't matter where it's at. In all cases, you can uh, look back at their, the way that they lived and what they did. And somewhere there you'll find an image of a God. Why do you think that is? You, you, you think that one group somewhere would just think, it's just, it's just live. We don't need to serve the sun or the moon or Zeus or whoever it is that they imagine. We don't, we, don't, we don't need this. It's just live. They had it in them to worship and to praise I believe it's in everyone that's ever been born. They may not do it. They may not do it. But I believe it's in them to do it. And I believe that is the expected end that God has for each and every one that's ever been conceived, that has ever been born, is to praise and honor Him. And I don't believe if you're here and lost... You're ever going to be happy. I don't believe those that have been saved by God's grace and not praising and honoring Him are truly happy. They don't look like it. You know, when we are the happiest is when we're filled by the Spirit of God and He uh, is in our midst. And we're rejoicing and praising His name and we're singing those wonderful songs and our cup is running over. That's the height of happiness in this world. There's nothing else that a child of God could imagine being that close to God. And what do you want to do when God is in your midst? You want to praise Him. You want to shout and you want to sing. You want to tell others about His goodness. You want to tell others about His love. 
It's not unnatural to praise God. That's how He made us. It's unnatural to turn away and refuse to. Natural, I hope you understand what I mean there. It's just in us. It's just in us. Maybe natural is not the right word. He says, I will praise thee. You say, what, what does God get out of all of this that he's done? All of this that he has done. And the anguish that we have put him through. The suffering of Jesus Christ. And all the effort that God has made. You say, well, God uh, is God. He, it's not really an effort. Well, he did it. What does he get out of this? Praise, honor, glory. It's all he wants. And when the psalmist looked at it, and when we were fearfully and wonderfully made, that I know right well. And when I see all that God had done for me and all the thoughts that he had for me, more than the sands of the sea, is he not worthy of our praise? Is he not worthy of our honor? Is he not worthy of our lives as a reasonable service unto God? Is he not worthy of all of those things? It says anything you do in life, do it as unto the Lord. I've told you when we went to Hawaii, we were getting ready to open up a a real estate firm there in Lafayette. Had worked for a few years to be ready. We're just about ready to do that. And the Lord called us to Hawaii. And uh, I thought of that one day when we were over there and I was cleaning an office complex and cleaning a bathroom I guess I was thinking about what could have been or or might have been and I probably wasn't appreciating the job I had that much it's a good job it's a respectable job but he says everything you do do it to my honor and to my glory he said, if you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. There's a lot of ways to praise God. You can praise God by helping your fellow men. You can praise God by giving them a drink of water. You can praise God by feeding them. You can praise God by picking them up and taking them to somewhere they need to go. You can praise God by doing all sorts of good deeds. For if you've done it unto them, he says, you've done it unto me. You can praise God by being obedient. You can praise God by coming on Sunday morning saying, Lord, what would you have for me to do? You can praise God in your prayers. You can praise God in your preaching. You can praise God in your testimonies. You can praise God every time that you open your mouth. And you can praise God by sitting there and never opening your mouth. But whatever you do, praise God. That's what we were made for. And if anyone goes out there and if they're a child of God and finds themselves, they're going to find, I need to praise God. If they're going out there to lose themselves, maybe they'll lose themselves and see, I need to praise God. That is what God has called me to do. That is the expected end. And that's what he desires and wants of me. In my life. And if you're in lost. You'll never be happy. Not truly happy in your heart. Till you are doing just that. And those that have been saved. Will never be truly happy here. In this life. If they are not. Doing that. 
Your people say, well, I can't wait to get to heaven where I can praise my Lord. I can't wait to, just to stand around the throne of God and just, just shout the heavens down. Well, why are we waiting? What are we waiting for? Do we have to wait to get to heaven to praise him? When no one will hear us but others of children of God and the angels that are around the throne of God? What is more worthwhile? Praising Him there or praising Him here where the lost world can see it? And that's what Jesus Christ has uh, tried to uh, show them there. You lift me up. That's praise and honor. And I'll draw all men unto me. Praise me here. While you have breath, it says in the Bible, while I have breath, I will praise the Lord. Do we have a song, Sister Ashley? If there's anyone here that's lost, we would invite you to come and seek the Lord. There is another act of praise is repenting of your sins, putting your full trust and faith in God. Is that not honoring God? Is that not making obeisance to God? Is that not admitting to Him that you truly in your heart feel like nothing, that He's everything to you? Is that not what that is doing? And you get up and you thank the Lord for saving your soul. That's a wonderful, beautiful example of praising God. Why don't you just start today? Let's stand and sing.